report on this computer. Move this over here. Move. Let's see. Then chat. We can move this right over here. So it's good to see you now. Okay. All right. So now that recording. Okay. Please note over here, right? Just that uh, as a reminder, you have to get your first vaccine by September 3rd, September 10th, or October 1st, if you haven't done so already, right? Uh, and that also depends on which vaccine you are going to get. This can be found at the front of TU portal in case you forget. Um, pretty much, you can pretty much walk into any CVS it seems like these days and, or any other kind of pharmacy-like place and get a vaccine. They're all taking just walk-ins. Um, They're even giving boosters now too. <laughs> have to look into that, but yeah. Yeah, because they're, uh, well, that, the CN CDC said is that first it's gonna take eight, eight months but now they scaled it back to six months because uh, there's a lot of there's a big issue with the Pfizer one of it after three months the uh, efficacy goes down. So uh, I got the Moderna and that works out pretty well for me. But we gotta. But again, if you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, do so. Just get it done. Mm -hmm. Time already. Agreed. Um, I have no idea what to do, but. That information uh, stored. Oh, yeah. Contact your PCP or your healthcare provider. They'll have, they'll have the lot number and you know can you know furnish another card for you. Or if you go to like the place that you got it, contact yep. them. They will get you a new one and it's free. They'll All right, you thank you. Yep. For that help, right? Um, even though even though I've been vaccinated, I'm still going to be doing. I'm still uh, going to be doing weekly testing simply because I'm living with an unvaccinated child because, you know, children are below a certain age. So um, again, just if you're on campus, remember to wear a mask. And, you know, we, we have rules and regulations set up for a reason. And speaking as a beard lover, it sucks not having, you know, with the masks. But, um, you know, I'd rather... You know, I, I've gone a while without having the flu or a cold. That's been pretty good. Yeah, and being not dead is pretty good, too. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Well, it depends on how far along you are in your, in your college years, you know. Mm. No, no, no. That's just feeling dead. We call uh, it, or, um, eventually become, you, you eventually become a lit, one of the living dead. We call those grad students. So. Um, uh, just my joke about grad students. All right, so, okay. Now with that being said, uh, this session is gonna be more of a, a bit more of an involved lecture than I, normally, than I normally do because I like to be a lot more project-based, but because we're just beginning and a lot of you are just beginners, I will be, um, going through and giving you the direction. So hopefully you've had the chance to um, uh, hopefully you've had the chance to do that. And I see the questions in chat and I will get to them in just a second. Uh, hopefully you've had the chance to watch the videos over here. Um, now with regards to the grading uh, your reading assignment not being graded, I did run the grader so um, if you're referring to it being graded on Canvas, then nobody's been been graded on Canvas yet, okay? So um, because the two systems don't talk to each other, and that's something I'll probably have to do to to move stuff over um, manually. Uh, with regards to uh, it being on RuneStone, it should be graded, and if it's not, please email me and like send me some screenshots so I have some additional info for that. Um, I did run the grader uh, late, uh, late uh, last night um, for, for exercises one and two. So those should have registered. But if not, 
let me know so we can resolve that so that there's not any issues for the uh, for these upcoming assignments. So I did adjust the dates. Um, I will be posting the quiz on Wednesday. Um, and that will be something. So what I've, again, what I've kind of decided to do is that um, last semester I was, you know, during the fully remote situ situation, I was just doing unproctored exam uh, quizzes because trying to proctor all these students, losing battle. So a lot, so essentially I was giving take home quizzes essentially. And then we are going to be doing, yes, you can email me if you need that extension because you just joined. Okay, essentially, and meet me for office hours, uh, go on the campus and sign up to office hours so that you can, I can catch you up. Anyway, um, long story short, we're gonna be doing a number of take home quizzes essentially, a number of quizzes that basically that you need to do by the deadline and within basically a set time period but you can choose to start that whenever you want is kind of the deal. And then- Is it timed? I mean, I can see when you've started and when you end it, and I can see when you've done that. Runestone records that data. So any kind of timing is gonna be man a manual manually, but technically it will be timed and it will have 45 minutes. The late penalty will be 0.1 point per minute, uh, which is not much if you think about it. Uh, yes, you should. That's a kind of a thing you do in one sitting, but the expected time is 45 minutes for these. Is it actually going to take us 45 minutes to do, or should it take us less than that? Should take you less, I think. I mean, these are going to be like four questions, essentially. No, these are actually some of them might be a multiple choice in the beginning, but these are also like a lot of these are coding are basic coding questions. Um, You'll see this one, this first one is not one to be worried about. It's mainly to make sure you understand how these are going to do. This is doing, this is done on your own. Yes, the quiz will release tomorrow. I will, and this is again, something to sit down and just do on your own um, whenever you want. I did five quizzes last semester um, and we'll see. But the idea here is that we're going to have these quizzes and then I think maybe twice in the semester, we'll do some some in. No, it doesn't appear on the Canvas calendar, probably. Uh, it will be due at midnight. Yes, I will post these things. I will post these for you. Six six. No, it's got to be nine. I I will fix this. Point being is that these take home quizzes are done at your own leisure, and they're meant to be you know challenging but not necessarily devilishly difficult um and then we'll have some in-person proctored examinations during your lab but those will be later essentially they'll be just quizzes that are worth a couple points more so this will help balance these out um there i i'm i my what I'm trying to do is give you, especially for intro students, I feel like it's more important to do frequent uh, uh, frequent assessments at lower state with each individual be assessment being a low stakes, rather than giving you a midterm and a final or two midterms and a final, where basically you get three high stakes, high stress exams. I'd prefer, you know, low stakes, moderate stress, because telling you to not be stressed out is kind of a losing battle. Makes sense, everybody. And besides, the more you, I give you, the more chances I can say, and yeah, I'll drop one. So, you know. <laughs> so, um, and again, if there's issues that come up that prevent you from taking it within the time period for some reason, let me know. This will be next, it will be posted, to, it will be posted tomorrow and you'll have like at least, uh, you'll have it like at least until Sunday to complete it. Okay. So with that, let's talk about actually programming some stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and boot up idle. So um, this is, now this is idle, which is hopefully something you're familiar with at this point. Um, let me go ahead and set it up so that's easier to read. Uh, let's see, do I have, um, 
Cascadia. Yeah, Cascadia code. There we go. That's my that's one of Microsoft's new fonts. Yeah, 25, why not? Okay. So there now it's nice and easy for everybody to see. Okay. Um now the reason that I uh use idle as opposed to any other for writing Python is because it comes pre-installed with Python. I'll be switching to another program later uh, later on, uh, down the line, but for right now I'm going to use idle because it's everything you really need. Um, you don't need any more, but also because it's got this useful feature called the REPL. Um, so if you haven't noticed in your labs yet, you have two modes of using, uh, of using idle. On the left, we have what's called a REPL, which stands for uh, read, evaluate, print, loop, meaning that that just describes what it is. It's a three-step thing. It reads the it reads the line, it evaluates it, then it prints the result, and then it does it again and again and again. The other way is a script. Now, neither you can now most of the time we'll be working on the right side because we're going to be writing scripts and running it. Okay, but. It's sometimes useful like today to just be able to do what's on the left side because I can just show you some basic um, mathematical operations. And that's primarily what we're gonna be covering in, today, in the upcoming quiz, which is the how to do mathematical operations in Python and basic stuff about variables, okay? So really we're gonna be learning to use Python as just kind of this really powerful calculator an overly powerful calculator, okay. So what is our, um, so what can we do with these calculators? Well, and again, this should be kind of a bit of a review for you if you watch the videos, but essentially we can do all the adding and subtracting like you would normally think. Four plus four is eight, five uh, times negative three would be negative 15. Spaces really in this case don't matter um, unless of course, and this is the one annoyance for Python that's kind of really seems pedantic on its point, which is that unless of course you have a preceding space where you'll get a syntax error, unexpected indent. So syntax errors means that you done goofed the language. Okay. The, it means that basically, so it means that computer pro science languages or computer programming languages are very pedantic when it comes to making sure that your syntax is uh, okay. When do you use an indent? Excellent question. I'll get that in a second. I'm just want to talk about the syntax error in general. So you, when you see this, this just means that your code is not going to run period because there's something wrong with the grammar. Now this time it happens with an indent. Python has a, is, so indents are unique about Python in the sense that it's good coding practice to use indents and Python's like, well, if it's good coding practice to use indents and you use indents in what are called blocks of code when you see something uh, that we need to do. So one example is like, suppose we have some kind of a condition inside an if statement, things we'll be getting to uh, later. If condition, then we want to do all of, uh, of the things that are indented inside the if condition. That's how you know to use an indent. Basically everything that so if this condition is true, then notice that these statements are indented and they're all indented the same amount and idle automatically indented it for me. Um, then all these things are going to happen as a result of that thing being true. Okay, another example is like when we do a for loop, uh, which looks really scary uh, for X in range five. But basically, the, Yes, we use indents instead of brackets like you would in C or Java. Also, we have a key monic we have a key character that tells us that Python to expect an indent. Anything time you see a colon, that means that we're going to start indenting things. So for right now, you're not going to be really writing anything that needs to be indented at any point uh, for this part. Uh, if you want to, you can use if statements. You are always allowed to use more than we've covered in class. Just be prepared to explain it if that's the case. Okay. 
So let's go back to our operations. So we've got your stand, you know, we've got, we've seen that we have multiplication, we have division, we can deal with neg, sorry, we have multiplication addition, we can deal with negative numbers, which of course means that I can do things like this, which is eight minus 90 and get a negative number out of that. We can also do division, but division is where it starts to get a bit weird, okay? Because division, you'll notice something over here. If I do six divided by, uh, divide by three, I'm gonna get two. 2.0 specifically. It's not gonna give me two, it's gonna give me 2.0, okay? And in programming languages, we really do care whether or not something has that decimal point or not, whether something is a floating point number or an integer, okay? Um, now, now, for those of you who are, who, who basically run as far away from math as possible, um, if at all possible, integers, if you hear that word, it's nothing scary. All that means is that it is a whole number. It means that it's one of these numbers that we can deal with that doesn't have decimal points. That, so like seven is an integer. And uh, negative 42 is an integer. Zero is also an integer, right? Anything that doesn't have a de decimal point is an integer. There's an infinite number of integers. Oh, and one cool thing about Python, it really doesn't care how big your numbers are. Other programming languages care, and you have to know that, that integers are 32 bits and long integers are 64 bits, but short integers are 16 bits. Um, Python just says integers are integers. If you need to make them bigger, we'll make them bigger. Make sense to everybody? So this is still an integer. It's a very big number, very, very big number, but um, it's nothing to be uh, super scared about. Now, when we deal with decimal points, we're dealing with division. I'm oh, sorry, when we're dealing with floating uh, decimal points, we're dealing with floating point numbers. We'll commonly see this when we use division. So say you do, again, eight divided by um, three, we'll get, uh, 2.6666666666 and then a five. Probably we're expecting the seven. I was certainly expecting the seven, right? But we got a five. Okay, more on that later, but just simply keep that in the back of your head because there's, because floating point numbers, they're kind of like the, what we're going to do in your calculator, but you'll see there's some idiosyncrasies. So, um, but we can do with floating point numbers, we can, add anything we want. We can even mix and match, but if we mix and match, then we're gonna convert, if that makes sense, right? 1.0 plus one, that's gonna give us 2.0. Makes sense? Um, this is because while there are an infinite number of integers, right? You can always add one to get a bigger integer. There's an even more infinite number of floating point numbers, tech, you know, in a theoretical standpoint. In Programming, there's actually a finite number, but <laughs> more on that in a bit. Um, it's, but the point being is that like there's technically more decimal points, so we allow that, so we so we convert to that because that allows us greater amounts of precision. Um, let's see, 1.0 e to the tenth. Yes, so it does support your scientific notation, by the way, if you're dealing with like a chemistry class, by the way. So, um, and if you're, and if, in case that, that, that made you go what? That means 1.0 times, and the E always means times 10 to the this power. So this was 10 to the 10th power. So if I did 2E10, sorry, 2E2, that would be two times 100. Okay, so floating point numbers. So let's go back to the division operation. Um, we can also do that for smaller numbers. Um, however, this is actually different. If you're coming from a programming language, this is where you, where you might be getting unexpected results in your mind, right? Because if you're coming from another programming language, um, and this might not make sense to a lot of you, 
if you're, unless you've done another programming language, you'd be expecting that six divided by seven would give you zero and seven divided by three would give you two. Make sense? The E is something you, I, I will never use, but it's used in science, uh, in the science to do, it's called scientific notation. And that just E means 10 to the second number power. So this meant two to the second power, which is a hundred. So it multiplied two by a hundred. Um, so if you're coming from a different programming language, you're expecting this, these things to have different results. Um, Python decided that for, inter, uh, for that, that didn't make sense because most people coming in expect that if I say 10 divided by four, I'm going to get two and a half. Okay. Um, but if most programming languages work like this, which is what we call integer division. So integer division, we just kind of toss out, that's indicated by doing two slashes. And when we do that, we just toss out the decimal point. We, we don't care about that data anymore. Now you might be wondering why in the world do we want to do this? Why are we going back to fourth grade math? You know, when we, did long division, but we can, and, and we did like two remainder, you know, well, two remainder two, right? Let's do another one. So 11 divided by four, right? This would be in fourth grade math. It would be two remainder three, right? Now, why am I talking about remainders? Well, because we have one more operation here that's related, which is surprisingly useful, which is this modulo operator. Um, it's a percentage sign, but we read it as mod or modulo. And what I'm saying here is actually a complete and total lie. It gives you the remainder. It's a complete and total lie. I just lied to you. Deal with it. Um, but, uh, but that's effectively what it does. It effectively gives you the remainder. It actually deals with like kind of um, really weird kind of just number space stuff where basically like you're doing math like you're on a clock but um but in essence when you do modular arithmetic like this when we say 11 mod 4 we're just giving you the remainder so the what's the remainder of 11 after it's been divided by 4 it's 3 left over deal with it people just deal with it um so if i say so if i say 100 mod, um, so if I say 100 mod 80, we'll have 20 left over. Um, if I say 100 mod 10, right, the remainder of this is zero because 100 is cleanly divisible by 10. So 10 divided by four, right? By default, when we're dealing with these with division, we're gonna assume that we want all, you know, as much precision as possible. So we'd get two and, a, two and a half here because 10 divided by four, everybody and their calculator will tell you that's two and a half. Uh, but a lot of times it's useful to not have to deal with remainders, sorry, not to deal with uh, decimal points. So the slash slash gives you everything but the, uh, but the decimal point. It just kind of tosses that out. It brings us back to fourth grade math. So it gives you the quotient and the remainder. So the remain, so if you did 10 mod two, you'd also, sorry, 10 mod four, you'd also get two, which is why it switched up to 11 mod uh, divide by four. So I could get two and three. Okay. Um, one common question you might find on a, on, on a quiz or something, by the way, that I like to do about, about these things is, uh, and I loved doing this on, on my written exams when I was doing written exams in a room was like, what is, um, you know, please evaluate this number. So what's the answer to that? It's zero, right? Because the remainder of anything divided by two is only one of two possibilities. It's zero if it's even or one if it's odd. Might be a bit more, it's a bit of a more natural kind of jump of that logic for some people than for others, right? Um, Another one that's even easier, but looks way more intimidating is when I do something like this, which is what is the remainder of this? 
or what is, what does this evaluate to? Not zero, but very close. Yeah, it's whatever. It's three five. It's three five three four seven two. Um, when you try to remember, when you try try to divide a bigger number by a smaller number. Um, sorry, when you try to divide a smaller number by a bigger number, you're going to end up with the smaller number, right? Because it's going to go in zero times. So you're left over with everything. Um, we're going to, this modular arithmetic is very useful when you're converting and you have some numbers left over during the conversion, such as um, your time conversion that you that's in your lab this week. Um, and we'll be seeing a lot more of this. There's also a bunch of tricks we can do with modular arithmetic, such as modding by two to see if it's even or if a number's even or odd, which is very useful, um, as well as like getting the last digit of something. It is, so modular arithmetic has its uses. Um, one last thing that I should mention is that this is one place where Python drastically differs um, from calculators and the way you typically expect things to be done, which is um, which is exponents. If you want to do exponentiation in Python, you would or in, in a calculator, you try doing this, right? This is five squared. Everybody agree that this is normally five squared. So we plug this in. That is not five squared, right? That's seven. Five times five is not seven. <laughs> okay. Makes sense to everybody? Five times five is not seven. Okay. So um, what's going on there? Well, that's a, uh, I believe that is the Zor operator here. Uh, for instance, we have some, uh, different operate uh, things called logical operators here in in programming languages that we care about um, and they have their own kind of syntax and stuff and you don't have to worry about them now or possibly ever until you get to have to deal with bit level uh, bit level stuff so don't worry about that I'll go into bits in a bit in a minute um, but just know that exponentiation isn't using the caret to do exponentiation to do five to the second power or five squared you you do the multiplication twice which makes sense because exponentiation is just repeated multiplication also i think that gives you a pretty good way of doing the square root of something let me see does that work i honestly don't know yeah it does work great okay remember the Square root is uh, is one to the half power. Okay. So we've got so those are your basic kind of cal uh, calculation operations you can do. Um, but what makes Python real and programming languages really powerful in general is the ability to put these things into variables. Um, now Python is a dynamically typed language, also known as a duck language. Um, which is that if a variable walks like a duck, looks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. I mean, it really doesn't care, um, unlike other languages, like where like uh, in C and Java, you have to say int x is equal to something. In other words, you have to define that this variable is going to be used to store an integer, and only integers. And I'm going to smack you in the face if, if uh, you try putting uh, an integer as something other than an integer in my integer box. I mean, the computers are very rude like that. I wouldn't actually smack people. Um, that'd be assault and a crime and I'd lose my job. So let's see. The, um, but as far as Python's concerned, these variables don't really care. I can put whatever I want in them. X is equal to five. And then I can ask for the value of X. So in a REPL, I don't have to type print because it assumes you it wants me to print everything. So here I just simply say X, and then I can say X is equal to hello. All right, so then print out hello. So that's another type that we deal with, letters. This is called a string, by the way. Uh, notice that I have double quotation marks over here and single quotation marks over here. Python doesn't care. Most of the programming languages use like this for, um, 
for a series of letters called a string, and they use single quotes for what they call a single glyph or a character called a character. Python's like, that's dumb. Everything should be strings to make it less complicated. So you can use either single quotes or double quotes for your strings. It doesn't really matter so long as you start and end with the same one, right? So strings are letters. And by the way, we can do operations on those guys too. Although not like what you're thinking, like hello plus three. I'm sorry, first off three, yeah. It's saying, hey, you can't concatenate strings to strings. Now nah, you can't really do that. No, you can add words to other words, which once you see how it works, makes sense. Hello with a space and world. It just kind of glues them together. Um, and you'd think that that would mean there's some kind of subtraction operation, but honestly, that's too complex and ambiguous, so it doesn't allow you to do that. Nor does it allow you to multiply words together, nor you can, can you divide words, okay? Because they only go for things that have kind of an easy, unambiguous meaning here, right? This makes sense. Adding two uh, words together means we kind of want to glue them together, okay? Now, notice that my, my string, strings here, or as, we, as they're called string literals, because they are literally just existing here and not inside a variable, they have quotation marks around them. And this is so Python knows that these are actually, you know, strings and not variables that I'm going to be using at some point. Okay, so I can add strings together. Um, there is one other operation you can do, and this is unique to Python. You can do basically everything I've just said in other programming languages, but this one's super unique. Yes, Gabe. Uh, what is the like techni technical difference between like a string and a variable? Like, what is a string? A string is a bunch of letters. Like, literally, it is the date. It is the data that whole. It is letters considered as data. So basically, if you sent a message, it would be in a string. So um, is it this kind of like letters versus numbers? Yes, a string is letters, integers, and floats are numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, a string is text. Variables, on the other hand, are the boxes that we're going to be putting stuff into to to, to so that we can remember it. Can you add an into a string? Yes, you can cast it. Uh, you can turn any type into any other type. For instance, I can turn a, anything into a string by throwing it into the SDR. So this will turn five, uh, five into a string, and then I can add them. What just happened? Oh, I hit enter while it was highlighted. So it erased it. There we go, hello five. So yeah, you can convert a number into a string like that. You can convert anything to a string. That's kind of useful. One kind of unique thing that uh, Python has that other programming languages doesn't is that it has one more operator, which is the um, multiplication operator. Any guesses as to what that's going to do? Yep, hello, hello, hello. Right, with the spaces, because again, that space is part of the text and it cares about the spaces. So, but a lot of you got the general idea, which is great. So, right? is kind of an intuitive meaning here. It's super useful because other times in other programming languages, I have to write something called a loop to deal with that. And that's annoying. And this says, just multiply by three times. The answer is fairly obvious there. So variables can hold any, anything. And the most, of the most of the base data you're gonna be working with are floats and integers. So I'm gonna say my int is equal to uh, seven, my float, assuming I can spell, I'll learn one these days. My float is equal to eight and a half. My string is equal to, this is a string. Okay. And basically if I use any of these later on, basically these things are stored in memory. One second. I, I realize I have a pen and I should make use of that. The magic pen, which 
and I have a magic screen, which allows me to draw on stuff. And I've got a magic program that allows you to see the magic drawings I put on the magic screen. So think of, of a variable as boxes. I've got a box here and I've got a label over here on top of the box and it says my int. And so what I did over here is called the assignment operator where what I've done is I've taken the thing on the right and I've stored it in the variable on the left. So I've taken my int and I've stored it in here. Like I've said previously, this is kind of the big thing you have to get in your head, which is that this operation over here is, and Jimmy, I do see your question. Uh, this operation over here stores uh, the value on the right into the left. It doesn't set those two things equal to each other. Okay, that may seem a bit of a pedantic difference, but you'll see why that's important in a bit. Yep, exactly. Uh, a float, an integer is a whole number. So anything without a decimal point and a float, if it has a decimal point, it's a float. So what this does over here is that first line, my int, that puts a seven inside. It puts a seven inside of there. And then when I ask for it again, it's gonna look into there and get it. Can you add a float into the float or nope, you can just, if they're numbers, then you can add them. That's pretty much un unambiguous and they're gonna get converted into a, into a float. So my int plus my float, yep. My int plus my float is equal to 15.5. Ah, excellent. Kayla uh, asks, does Python have double values? And that is correct. Um, Kayla, the floats are doubles. Just like it's kind of, just like Python considers it nonsense to have differently sized integers, uh, Python considers it nonsense to have differently sized floats. So it just uses doubles because that's what everybody uses this at this point. And if you wanted to be super, and if you wanted your programs to be memory efficient, you'd be working in C, not Python. Not to say that Python's wasteful, but if you really care to the point about how many exact bits you're gonna be using, it's in Python. So what is a bit? Um, bit is short for binary digit. So all of our numbers are kind of made up of, are stored as zeros and ones on the computer. Again, it's, it's sometimes hard to remember that the computer is just a rock that we tricked into, think by sh into thinking in by shocking it with electricity. Um, and as a result, all we can do is store zeros and ones in it. And so underneath the hood, all these things are gonna be stored as zeros and ones. Ishan, yes, you can convert it into, you can convert it into a float. So you can convert anything to anything else. So I can say, hey, my int, I can say, uh, sorry, my float. So I can say int my float, and that will convert my float to an integer. Or rather what it will do, it's gonna take, it's gonna look at the va value inside my float and give me what it is as a result of an integer operation. Yep, it just strips out, it just strips it out, as you can see. It just cuts off the decimal. None of that net rounding nonsense. If you want to round it, there's a we have we have operations for that. Uh, what languages most companies have uh, their employee write code in? Whatever's popular. Um, seriously, uh, Python's got gotten a pre Python, Java, and C are fairly well represented in industry. Um, and once you learn how to do one language, it's actually, it gets to, it, once you've learned trivial and you've been programming for about, I'd say two years, it's kind of trivial to pick up another language. So how do you round decimals in Python? Uh, math.round, which we'll get into, that's in the math, math library, which we cover in chapter four. Um, so now there is, now you gotta understand though that um, that floats are 
IEEE floating point numbers, which means that you've got to be careful with them sometimes. So it means that they don't always work the way you'd expect them to. 1.0 plus 2.0 plus 3.0. That actually works exactly as you'd expect them to, right? Everybody agree? No surprises there. So, however, if I did this and I've got nothing up my sleeves, right? We get 0 0.3 and a teensy weensy little bit, right? We expecting 0 0.3 and we get this bit on the end over here, right? Now, why is that happening? Well, it goes into much like the, when you, we do when we work with a when you work with a calculator. Actually, I have a button to do that right now. Hey, calculator, right? So if I do one divided by three on my calculator, I'm going to get this nonsense. And if I get two divided by three on this calculator, sorry, two divided by three, not two divided by six, I get this nonsense, right? Where I've got this repeating number, right? infinitely repeating number, okay? So what's going on over there? Well, we can't really properly write out two divided by three or two thirds as a decimal point, right? The, the 10, the, um, the decimal system just isn't built for that. So in a similar way, we are dealing, while we are looking at 10, uh, we're dealing with base 10 numbers, decimal numbers. Your computer is dealing with binary. So we convert these into binary, okay? And then what happens is that we when we convert these into binary, these get stored on the computer. And then when we want to get an answer, it gets reconverted uh, back into decimal. Now, we don't necessarily lose data per se, but, um, you know, when we convert to binary, there are some numbers in binary, like this aforementioned abomination here, which is 1.0 converted to binary, plus two, zero point, sorry, 0 0.1 converted to binary and 0 0.2 converted to binary. When we add those numbers in, the end result has basically gives a bit of an error in there from that conversion process, from that inaccuracy of trying to restore base tens as base twos. And so that's what comes out sometimes. Um, this happens rarely. This is actually a contrived example. And it, and unless you saw this, you'd probably not see it. You might see it in your temperature conversion, uh, conversion program. If that happens, just know that it exists and we'll learn how to deal with those later. So binary numbers, right? Give me one second. Let's go to the whiteboard. No, I'm not actually gonna to go to a whiteboard. I'm just gonna draw it on a whiteboard over here. Essentially, it's a good way to think of it as a rounding error. If you want more detail, it's more than I wanna go into in this lecture because I do want us to take time to have some fun with our activities. Um, but I should teach about binary arithmetic. Again, I don't mind having to adjust my schedule and go slower or faster. I end up, I ended up with plenty of time. Um, oh, right. So I need to clear the other stuff that I was writing. So clear all drawings, stop drawing. There we go. Okay. So a binary number is like this. So what we have here is a decimal number, 953. Okay, um, you can think of that as instead being 900 plus 50 plus three, right? Um, more specifically by, if we say something's in the decimal system that, or base 10, that means that we're dealing with these numbers that are, well, deal with, um, that can be interpreted that can be encoded using base 10 numbers. So here, what I'm doing is I'm saying that this is, and then they can be, I'm saying these can be encoded as multiples of 10. 
So nine times 10 to the second power plus five times 10 to the first power plus three times 10 to the zeroth power. Everybody see that in my terrible handwriting? That basically I'm, I've got 900 plus, uh, plus fifth, five times 10 plus three times one, okay? Now binary system works the exact same way, but instead of with everything being multiples of, of 10, they're multiples of two. And you only have two possible values, one or zero. So if I'm going to be dealing with, um, so here's a number. So this is how numbers look in binary. So we have zero. So zero, zero, then we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, how do we translate this? Say I've got something like this. Okay, how do I translate this? Mm-hmm. I have no idea what it is, but I mean, like, I will be happy to try it to show you how I get there. So what I know is that basically that I can, that I've got going from right to left, I've got zero times two to the zeroth power plus two to the first power plus one, times two to the second power plus zero times two to the fourth plus zero time, sorry. One times two to the fifth plus, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Professor, I kind of learned a different method to this that I kind of like. Um, so uh, if you do, if you take a number and you divide it by two and keep going divided by two, divided by two. Uh, so like, let's say 531 divided by two, you get a, a different number, divide that by two. So you always get one or zero. And then once you're finished with it, you turn your paper over and then you can get the binary for that number. Ah, that's where I messed up. Um, but that, yes, but that's converting from a binary, from a decimal number to a binary number. Here, I'm doing it the other way around. Ah, uh, gotcha. Not it. Right. So here, let me start, start this over again, because it just became a bit of a mess, because I lost my place while I was talking. So here, I've got a, a six, I've got a six bit number. It's got six digits, six binary digits, six bits. So here, that means that I'm going to be starting with five, four, three, two, one, zero, because the last one's always uh, the zeroth power. So um, one times two to the fifth plus one times two to the fourth plus zero times two to the third plus zero plus one times two to the second plus one times two to the first plus zero times two to the zero. So we can convert this and say we have, so we have zero over there plus two plus four plus, this would normally be eight, but it's zero because it's zeroed out. Then a 16 and a 32. So what we have here is we have 32 plus 16 plus four plus two, which Let's figure that out very quickly. That becomes 20. So, so 20 plus this is equal to 52 plus two is equal to 54. Tricks for doing uh, big number, uh, multi adding multiple numbers, try to figure out which of these numbers, if you add them together, give you basically a number in base 10. Like, so, or sorry, give you a multiple 10. So 16 plus four, give me 20 then 20 plus 32 is equal to 52. So that made it pretty okay. easy. Um, this is not something I'll test you on, but that's what it means. And, and that's just for integers. 
um, dealing with characters and um, and uh, so dealing with characters is a completely different uh, story and uh, floating point numbers is a different story. So, but, so, but to point you in the right direction, if you want to find this out, because this is not something that I want to deal with in my, in my coding class is that you, it's a uh, I triple E standard for not floating, but for, let me look for double. So it's called double precision because it uses 64 bits. Um, and what you have is that you have one bit set over for the sign, 11 bits set over for the exponent, and then the rest is set over for the fraction. And then it's just this monstrosity. I had to do that in a, in a hardware level class. Um, the end result of this is that we don't worry about any of this um, chazarai. It's just kind of, you, you don't need to deal, is that we don't work in binary. We've tried that. It's awful. It's slow. So the last concept I want the so the last important concept I want to show you with variables is that we can change variables. So my int is equal to 11. So currently it's equal to seven, right? My int is equal to um, let me check the time. I'm worried I'm running low. Okay, yeah. So my int is equal to 11. This takes 11 and it stores it in the box labeled my int. Okay. And so now my int has a value of 11. But now, but be, right, I didn't just say seven is equal to 11. I said I'm storing 11 inside this thing. Okay, inside this variable. Yes, you can do minus equal plus equals. Um, but I prefer to be a bit more explicit with that right now, especially for this. Um, we can also use other variables. So I can say X is equal to five. So I could do my int is equal to five plus X. Or actually let's do two times X, right? Two times X. So the way this works is that we do everything on the right side of the, uh, uh, of the assignment statement, the equal sign, before we do the, before we then assign it to the variable on the left. So two times X, what is X? X is five, we stored five in X. So that's equal to 10. Then we take 10 and store it in my int. Okay. Now, again, I looked up the value of X. So this is important. I looked up the value of X and I retrieved the value of X. And then I stored the value that we evaluated into my int. I'm trying to be very specific of the language because if I change x to two, x is now two, this is not going to change my int, right? It does not create an equation. It's not creating a binding. This isn't the equal sign. This is the assignment operator. We take what's on the right and we store it in the left. We evaluate what's on the right we take that result, copy it into the left variable. Make sense? So there's no hard binding. So the result of this is that you get something that looks like an utter nightmare, but isn't actually. But it looks like it to beginners. So the value that is now stored in my integer, so my integer right before we did this was 10. So now that I do this, well, again, how does this work? It's got the same variable on the left and right. Well, Python just doesn't care, nor does pretty much any programming language. We, because this is the assignment operator, not the equal sign. So that means that what we've got over here is that we take this value, we figure out what it is, it's 10, we add one to it, gives us 11, and then we take 11 and we store it into this value. It doesn't create a computational error because that's not, we're not setting two things equal to each other. We're not saying that these, thing, these two things have a binding together and they should move when the other moves. Can you imagine just how 
horribly complicated that would be if basically, if I set up my int is equal to two times X, right? And then if I change two, the value of the of my int changes. Oh, furthermore, what if like X was equal to two times uh, two and a half, sorry, two times Y and Y is equal to two and a half and then I change the Y value. Like, the the amount the amount of like just kind of processes that would have to you'd have to remember is a nightmare. So less mental overhead. Okay. So right now we've been dealing with basic data types and storing those into variables. But for our short activity today, I want to introduce you to one data type that we're going to be using much a lot later on in the book. Um, and now to use this, because it's not going to be primarily used in Python, sorry, it's not loaded by default, I have to say the default were the special words I said last time, which is import turtle. Um, now, what you want to do is that if you is go to RuneStone, like right now, go to RuneStone Academy, go to our course, okay, and scroll down because apparently the they moved the projects down to here and do project two, which is driving the turtle, which is fairly straightforward. What we want you to do is see how the turtle, and then in the last 10 minutes of class, I want you to try drawing something with it. So what is a turtle? Turtle are the is, is well, let me make one first. I'm going to create my turtle and I'm going to call him Bob because that's super easy for me to type, okay? three letters, doesn't get much simpler than that. And so this is basically the only special command you need to know. Import turtle just simply says, load up the turtle thing. Bob is equal to turtle. By the way, if you're doing this in the script on your computer, do not save it in a file named turtle. That will confuse things. More on that later. I go into why on videos. So I suggest for right now working in RuneStone because it's built in there. Um, and that's how you, save your credit for this. So Bob is equal to turtle dot turtle. Now, turtle is a package. So I'm basically saying inside the turtle package, there's this thing called turtle, which makes a turtle. We'll go into more detail about how that magic phrase works. But now Bob is a special variable. He's a turtle. And actually, I got something to appear on my screen with it. So cool. Right? When I so now I've got a board. So this little arrow here, that's my turtle. We're taking a bird's eye view of this little, of this little dude over here. Um, and since he's an arrow, he's pointing, you know, to the right. Technically he's on a, on a graph, a Euclidean graph, your standard, your standard graph that you've been dealing with since uh, you learned what a graph was. So he's stationed at zero, zero, and he can move to basically any X, Y coordinate that he wants. Uh, professor, <clears throat> on the lab three for next week, you have a picture of an actual turtle. Is this good enough for the turtle, though? Just have this arrow. Do you want a picture of a turtle? Um, I'll show you how to do the turtle um, on that. That's just like a command that I do to set the shape up. Okay. For right now, I'm trying yeah. to keep it pretty minimalistic. Sure. Sorry about so, that. So we can do some, so let's just learn what we can do with him. He's got some commands. By the way, notice that a menu popped up when I hit Bob dot. So Bob is a, is a um, turtle. Um, and basically, and that's a type of object. What is an object? That means it's a complex data type. It's made up of basically stuff a bit more advanced. It's made up of like lots of numbers and lots of strings. Uh, strings and things like that, and other information that's necessary. So Bob has a couple really useful commands. The first one is forward, which, as I mentioned last time, tells him how to move forward a certain number of pixels. So, and what we're seeing is that this turtle basically imagine he's got a little uh, a little paintbrush on his tail and he's just dragging it across this canvas, right? And it's top and it's a top down view. We can tell him to go back uh, forward. We can also tell them to turn right or left and that'll be in degrees. So none of that radians nonsense. So um, if we tell them to turn left, so Bob dot, if we say left 90 degrees, just say 90. 
right? It just takes an integer. And then we can say Bob dot back to go backwards. And let's go ahead and say 100 pixels. All right. And let's go ahead and Bob dot back. We can also, there's also, sorry, there's also other things we can do like Bob dot, I think circle is one of them. Yeah, radius. Let's draw a radius with a hundred. I'm sorry, with a 500 pixel perimeter. And yeah, don't worry, he'll come back. Again, the, the space is kind of, he's on a graph. It's infinite just because it's not on the page doesn't mean you can't see it. Um, so there's all sorts of commands you can do with this. And again, he's got this little paintbrush. So you can do Bob dot uh, color, of course, to um, and tell it a color like red. And notice that Bob is red now. It might be a bit hard to see because Bob isn't that big, but Bob dot uh, forward 250. And we see that he can draw in a color. We're gonna be going into a lot of detail with turtles because they really help you visualize repetition and uh, other concepts like that. Because you know, printing out text is great, but it's always nice to be able to draw stuff. You should definitely be doing this on RuneStone because what I want you to do now with the last bit of class is let's take a look at on RuneStone driving the turtle. And for those of you who couldn't find it, I'm going to just drop it right here in chat. Give me a second. Should have done that earlier. Boom. Be sure to log in if you want to get credit for it. Um, and you know, you probably do. So no worries there. So our first activity here is like, here's the code I sh uh, showed you last time. There's a lot about turtles, by the way. Um, if you want to know all the commands, turtle docs, turtle doc Python. So this is the documentation for the turtle library. It literally has all the commands that exist for turtle. Um, might be written a bit obtusely, a bit more technically than you might be than you might be comfortable with, but the resources are there. So if I click this button over here, save and run, it runs this code. So I like this about RuneStone because it executes these things inside RuneStone, which is great. So what we can say is my turtle is equal to this turtle. It just set it to green. It said, go forward 50. Then here's a command that I didn't show you how to do, up and down. That doesn't mean like direction wise. That means that he's lifting his tail up so that he lifts up the paintbrush that's attached to his tail and down puts that paintbrush back on the ground. So it allows you to create gaps. So notice that he moved forward 50 and they lifted up his paintbrush and he moved forward another 50 and then he put his paintbrush down. Then he turned to the right and backed up. Is turtle used like to reference like the drawing? Like, are we like actually referencing an actual like picture of a turtle or is that just like the point that we're at? The turtle is the point where we're at. It's so okay, it's got it. it comes from a name from so the turtle is this little is the little guy called an arrow. We can actually change his shape, um, and we'll see how to do that later. Again, time constraints today. And oh no, I think I forgot to grade project one. So uh, or run the grader for that. So um, turtle is it, you can make it do very you can do powerful things like turtle, like even write an entire game in turtle. Although there are better tasks for that. Um, oh yeah, you can, you'll see that I can use, uh, that I'll use turtle to basically animate something, uh, and create some, um, especially when we start doing when, and I do one explicitly in Monte Carlo approximations where I use turtles to show you a simulation of throwing darts at a dartboard to simulate pie, which sounds kind of ridiculous, but anyway. So be sure, so run this one. And then for the last 15 or so minutes in class, what I want you to do is draw an inter interesting picture. Try playing around with turtle in this box. 
And then once you're done, answer the following questions about, about how you felt about this. So I literally just want you to try just making stuff and doing things. Um, you know, as Ms. Frizzle says, get messy, make mistakes, you know? So the up says, so, so the, this little arrow is a turtle. When, when we, he's got a paintbrush attached to his tail. So when he moves across this giant canvas of paper, he's dragging along the paintbrush with him. When we say up, that lifts up his tail. So he's not uh, leaving any more paint behind. Make sense? Yeah, I'm currently rewatching a lot of Magic School Bus because I have a four and a half year old at home. So. Well, you know, they came out with a new one, I think on Netflix. He likes both of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right, so I'll let you get to it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'll let you get to work. This one's a short exercise. Um, on on Wednesday, uh, so if you haven't read, watched my videos yet for this chapter, um, that project one was the thing we did in class on Tuesday. Sorry, on thir last Thursday. Um, if you didn't do it, find it under module one. It's linked there and you can do that. Um, it was the project one was the figuring. Yeah, it was the bell thing with the bell and the, and the deranged squirrel. Were we supposed to read every, all, watch all of those videos or just the first one? Um, one second. I think I'm still recording. Give me a second. Yep, I'm still recording, so great. Um, screen one there. So here we want to watch all the videos in here. So if, if you haven't had them watched, then watch them today or watch them by Thursday, you know, okay. um, just try to have, and, and try to have the readings done so that you can properly work on your lab. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, right. quick question. Uh, just letting Messy. you know that uh, mm -hmm. you you didn't post a link for Project One on Canvas. Yeah, that's on. It's under modules, I believe. Give me a second. If you go to module and you click on the module one overview, it's uh, a preview of the end goal. That's what it was. So it's the so it's the first thing listed. in our um, textbook, the first to project listed in, the, uh, in our textbook. Uh, can you show again how to access the videos on the modules? Sure. So um, pretty much in every module, and I'm, I've been going through and I think I did the first three uh, I put up the first three modules worth of uh, exercises and stuff. Um, if we go into any module, you'll see I have a I have a video, except it's not actually a video; it's a playlist. So if you play it, it will go on to the next one. But if you want to go to all the individual videos in the playlist, you go ahead and click on the top right, and there they are. There, I try to make it so that no video ever exceeds fifteen minutes. Uh, like let's see, function calls. So you might be thinking to yourself, wait, seven, that one, yeah, that one's seven minutes. And then I have a postscript that for because I forgot to add stuff. And then five minutes on data types. Then converting variables with seven minutes. So I try to keep it below the time you would normally get in a lecture. Because most of the time when we're in lecture, we're uh, this today was is an anomaly. Most of the time when we're in lecture, we're going to be doing uh, projects. Uh, in class exercises. Okay. And go ahead and there we go. And there's some message in chat. Okay. Yeah. If you have to leave, then you can leave. I mean, what you're doing here, I'll run the grader like at the end of the week. But like, this is just basically just to do stuff. Um, if you didn't see it in the module two overview here, I'll drop it again in the chat. 
but it was more just go to the textbook and get to project two. So if you didn't find it, um, here's the link, unless somebody else already posted it. Nope, nope, nobody actually posted it. There we go. Can I ask you? Yeah, uh, go ahead. When I, was, when I was testing out my turtle, uh, I was using a for loop instead of the circle. And, you know, I, I changed it so that it would be like a take, you know, for, for in range of uh, 0 to 360, you know, go one degree, one space, one unit, and then turn one degree. And yeah. then, so how do you make it to figure out exactly how far apart you want? Or like, if you want to start in the middle? That's an excellent question. And we're actually going to cover that in uh, future projects. Um, if you've done your, if you've, if you did your code in RuneStone, it will uh, then you don't need to do anything. It's automatically saved. Yep, you're just doing the turtle thing on RuneStone, the short turtle exercise on RuneStone. So the one that says, "Hey, here's some code," and then, "Hey, please try drawing some, uh, making your own drawing." I just want you to get some exposure. Yep. So you just hit save and run, and you're done. And then answer basically how this project is making you feel. Uh, whether you think it's interesting, whether you were panicking or not. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, will it also show a check mark right next to it? At, like just like the, the reading, like on top of that, or would it just stay blank? Uh, the projects? No. So from okay. what I understand, because I've never actually had students who cared about the check marks until this semester for some reason i don't know um so the check marks will appear for your readings as you do them but there's no place for the check marks to appear for the projects so don't worry about the check marks for the project however at the end of a project you'll see that they're completed and a lot of these are are graded for completion like did you complete all the activities on the page um some of them have tests that get run on them but for the most part, these kind of things are, are there to help you. We grade you for participation in class, not for, um, not necessarily for like the correctness of what you're trying. Because I want, in, when we're in this lecture se session where we're doing short bursts of work, as we'll see on, on, on Thursday, I want that to be a lot less stressful about worrying about getting all the right answers and more about trying to learn. Yes, uh, um, Lynn. Oh, okay, Lynn, don't worry about your grade on Canvas. It's going to be a zero. Everybody's grade is currently a zero on Canvas for chapter one readings. Right now, because I, I have to manually transfer everything over, which is a bit of a process. It takes me like a couple. Yeah, the grader runs and it gets you your grade on RuneStone but it doesn't get your grade on Canvas. The two systems don't talk to each other. Because um, that's why I ask you to put to, to log in with you, to create an account that has a certain name. Um, this is so that when I, uh, I have a script that merges the two files and we'll look at it, we'll even look at the script later in the semester because it's written in Python and it's something that you should be able to write at the end of this class. Um, what you don't see is what, you know, then you know my inputs and outputs because those have personal information on that, but you can see the file. Does it? Um, you can schedule. So you can schedule the office hours below my. Um, you can schedule the office hours on on the front page of Canvas. So you go to Canvas, right? Um, however, let me. Importantly, 1.12, you don't need to do. You only need to do the assigned exercises. 1.12 wasn't assigned. Because this is a, a contributed textbook, people add their own problems. And sometimes people are not smart and they just go ahead and add the problem to chapter one for some reason, because that's the first chapter in the default choice. So a bunch of other stuff ends up there that shouldn't be in chapter one. This isn't a problem for later chapters, so but it's only a problem for the first week. So don't worry about chapter 1.12 because those are like 
Some of those questions are stuff that they expect you to do at the end of the semester. Yeah, you are free to go when you are done, by the way. Do you drop the lowest lab I grade? I, yeah, I drop, I drop, I drop, I drop at least two grades or something like that. So, yeah, it looks like you dropped maybe three grades. It depends. Yeah, it depends on how on all the exercises. Um, mm. mm -hmm. Cool. Gillon, the on the right part where you've got turtle dot turtle. That is magic words right now. But turtle, the undercase turtle, is the turtle package. That is the thing you just imported. Okay, when we say import turtle, the lowercase turtle, that is the package. Inside of turtle is some, and so to reach inside some inside something in programming, we use the dot. So the turtle, capital T turtle with the with the um, with the parentheses, that is the um, a what, what's called a constructor um, for. It is basically the instructions for building the turtle object. So the thing, so all the things we need to do, um, all the things the computer needs to do to build a turtle. So the right part of that variable is simply saying, build me a new turtle, give me a turtle. In fact, you can actually, uh, and that does imply, and you'd be correct to assume that that does allow you to make multiple turtles. Um, okay, so you and Chris, I have issues with my room. I did my one, but my assignment progress is zero percent. Can you do it again? Yes. Um, if you, I, if you want to stay behind after the lecture, I can, I can take a look if you want me to, but otherwise, like, again, if you're done with the, with creating your drawing, which again, this is just kind of a participation grade thing. So it doesn't have to be a super intense you don't have to give me a Mona Lisa or a Picasso, although you probably end with, up with something that's Picasso shaped. Um, you know, yes, PJ. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm looking at the um, the different uh, like commands it gives us, and one of them says, well, two of them actually say my turtle dot forward fifty. One of them says draw a green line of length fifty, and another one says move forward fifty without drawing and they're the same command, but yes, and they both draw. So I was just kind of wondering how I can get it to move without drawing. That is rely great question. That's what the up and down commands above and below it are. So when okay. it when it's up, it's lifting its tail, and that allows you to move the turtle around without drawing anything. Oh, okay, awesome. Okay, thank you. No worries. No question. Mm hmm. Uh. So for project one, uh, it says I have completed nine out of 10 of, uh, activities, but I don't know why it says I that. think there, there's one other one that you have to run, which is like, it's kind of a compressed bit of code above the, it's above the squirrel, I believe, um, where basically it says show, it's like a little box that says show code in it and other stuff. You need to show the code and run it once. Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you, though. No worries. Go ahead and stop recording.